Hello everyone, my name is Mehleka Samdani. I would like to welcome you all to a new program series called Window to Islam. The series seeks to improve understanding of Islam and American Muslims here in Western Massachusetts at a time when misconceptions have adversely affected communal relations. There are approximately two to six million Muslims who live in America. The American Muslim community is extremely diverse and heterogeneous. Despite the growing number of American Muslims, a Time magazine poll in 2010 showed that 60% of Americans have never actually met a Muslim and approximately 40% of Americans have an unfavorable view of Islam. Through conversations on this program, we hope to reverse this trend and create better understanding. For our first program, we are going to focus on the basic principles of Islam. To help us understand the fundamentals, we are joined today by Professor Kamal Ali of Westfield State University. He is a professor of ethnic and gender studies, imam at the Hampton County Sheriff's Department, and also member of the board of directors of the Islamic Society of Western Massachusetts. Dr. Ali, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you're very and, welcome. And welcome to the program. Mm -hmm. Let's begin with the meaning of Islam. Uh, what is it and how does it relate to previously revealed religions? That question is uh, one that one could write a dissertation on, but I'll give you the abbreviated answer. Mm -hmm. First of all, Islam is an Arabic word that means essentially peace. Mm -hmm. uh, it also means submission, in this case submission to God or to Allah. It's important to understand that Islam for us is something that is done. That means it is a verb. It's not just a noun. Submission to Allah or to God to Muslims means that we are following the practice of virtually literally everything in the universe. Since God is the creator of all things, all things submit to him. Or we could say to her because we don't believe that God is a man or a woman, that he is black or she is white or whatever. Rather that God uh, is the creator of black men and white men and white women, etc. So there is no gender attached to Allah or the creator. Submission then in Islam means that we follow a prescribed um, methodology as taught by the Prophet Muhammad, who we think of as the last and final prophet, mm -hmm. and we'll talk more about that later, I'm sure. But it's important to understand essentially that uh, the, the primary issue for us as Muslims when we talk about Islam is to submit. Additionally, I guess it's safe to say and maybe to add that we in, as practicing Muslims do not look at Islam so much as a religion as we look at it as a way of life. So that in Islam there is no separation between church and state. That means, and that is to say that uh, Islamic folk, Islamic people practicing this religion don't necessarily look at it as a religion that's practiced, say, for example, in the Christian context from 2 to 10, uh, I'm sorry, 10 to 2 o'clock on a Sunday morning or afternoon, but rather it's the way we live our lives in totality in submission to, to God. Great. Um, could you then describe for the benefit of our audience what the fundamental principles of Islam are? Yes. Um, Fundamentally, Islam is usually looked at as a religion based on five distinct pillars. Mm -hmm. The first pillar, and it's important to understand this, is this idea, which is not un uncommon to other um, monotheistic religions, is the notion that God is one. And we call that Tawheed, which is literally taken from the Arabic word Wahid, meaning one. That we believe there is only one God. And it is manifest, this idea of Tawheed, in this expression that is very common among Muslims that you hear them recite constantly, which is La ilaha illallah. There is no thing, no one thing worship, worthy of our worship, rather, than the one God, Allah. La ilaha illallah. There is no God, small g, but God, big G. Mm -hmm. um, that Tawheed is, if you were to view Islam as a circus tent, one of those tents with the, the higher pillar and the other four pillars, 
that support the, uh, the, the structure that we call a tent, then the tallest pillar would be Tawheed, mm -hmm. this idea of the oneness of God, again, which is shared by all the monotheistic faiths. Secondly um, is prayer. Mm -hmm. And prayer in Islam we look at a little differently in other religions, and I'm talking about what we call Salah. Mm -hmm. Salah, which is ritualistic prayer that occurs five times every day at specific times during the day. Mm -hmm. The idea of spontaneous prayer is not foreign to Islam, but Salat is different than that. Mm -hmm. Salat is prescribed, it's usually done in congregation. That's why on the television when you watch Muslim movies, you see Muslims lined up in rows right. performing their prayers, their devotionals as they're called. Um, and it's something that is actually done by every practicing Muslim, prayer uh, before sunrise, prayer uh, at noon, prayer at midday, mm -hmm. prayer at sunset, and prayer at night. Um, this idea of supererogatory prayers or de devotional prayers that are done spontaneously are called dua, mm -hmm. and those are very personal prayers, but the ritualistic salah is done by every Muslim who practices this faith. Mm -hmm. The third pillar of the five, <clears throat> excuse me, is uh, we call zakah, which is charity. Again, nothing new. All the monotheistic faiths practice charity, mm -hmm. tithing in the sense of the Christian faith and other kinds of charity in the Jewish religion. Um, and zakah means that we devote part of our savings, that is to say money that we own or have earned rather, or wealth that we have beyond what we need, mm -hmm. we devote to the poor. Mm -hmm. um, and this zakah is traditionally done at the end of the month of Ramadan, mm -hmm. which is the fifth, fourth rather, pillar of Islam, mm -hmm. the pillar of Islam that we are practicing here and now. This is the month of Ramadan that this program is being taped. Um, and the month of Ramadan, Muslims all fast from about an hour before sunrise mm -hmm. to immediately after the sun sets. And in this uh, hemisphere, that means that we're arising um, at three in the morning, we're having our breakfast or suhoor, uh, a, a pre-dawn meal um, before 4.30, and we begin our fast at 4.30 or thereabouts, and we fast until sunset, which today I think will be around 8.22 or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So it's a very long fast. Um, and the fast is from food and drink. Interestingly, just yesterday I was talking to someone, a friend of mine who's a Christian, and he was surprised to learn because he offered me something to drink. Mm -hmm. And I said, we don't drink in Ramadan. He was shocked. Right. He thought that we could actually drink, but that is not the case. We abstain from food, from drink, from cohabitation with our spouses, mm -hmm. from those of us who unfortunately may smoke cigarettes. Anything mm -hmm. that passes our lips is forbidden except for prayer. And the last and final pillar of Islam is Hajj. Mm -hmm. And that is the pilgrimage that every practicing Muslim makes, if he or she can afford it, at least once in his or her lifetime, to Mecca, mm -hmm. to Bayt Allah, the city of the house of God, um, where they perform uh, certain rites of Hajj. It's a three-day um, uh, obligatory uh, uh, performance of rituals. Um, I made Hajj in 1990 the first time. And um, I can tell you that this, in my life, there's been no more meaningful a drip or journey than making Hajj. Uh, where you see the cross-section of Muslims, this, mm -hmm. this diverse community you're talking about, which is ironically mirrored in the West. Mm -hmm. I mean, sure. if you go to Africa, and I do travel to Africa quite a bit, and when you go to the Masjid or Masajid in Africa, everyone's an African. Right. If you go to Pakistan or India or Arabia, everyone's a Pakistan or a Bengali or an Arab. Exactly. But here in this country, a country of immigrants, one truly feels this notion and this idea and this reality of the homogeneousness of Islam, the diversity of Islam. Right. And it's an amazing thing to, to, to behold. Um, I think in a nutshell, and again, this, this is about distillation of these very grand concepts into sure. bite-sized chunks. Maybe that will suffice for now. Um, you know, you talked about Ramadan and uh, the fact that we're fasting this month. Um, and you talked about the ritual aspect of it, you know, the duration of the fast. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk a little bit more about the spirit of Ramadan and what the purpose of it? What is the purpose of us fasting? 
uh, Ramadan is, in the Quran it says, Ramadan, uh, fasting is prescribed for you, meaning Muslims, that it was prescribed to those before you, mm -hmm. that you may learn self-discipline. Um, so that's one aspect, and there are many aspects of Ramadan. Mm -hmm. Our Imam was talking just yesterday at an interfaith dinner mm -hmm. um, about this idea of Ramadan and the idea of it being done for God. It's the one thing that Muslims do that only God, only Allah knows that we do it. Mm -hmm. And it is about this idea of bringing together this diverse community into an act that is unifying us in a way that reflects our concern, our heartfelt concern. Mm -hmm for doing those things that reflect, number one, our discipline, our connectedness, also letting us understand how it is when people less fortunate than ourselves who may be going to bed without eating, and that happens far too often in this world, so that we begin to understand something about and maybe have an affinity for the idea of the poor, mm -hmm. of the downtrodden, those people who are marginalized in mm -hmm. whatever way, shape, form, or fashion. And in that respect, it is like many aspects of Islam a constant reminder of this notion of social justice in the world, of social injustice in the world, mm -hmm. and that we as people who are practicing this faith based on this idea of peace should be not only concerned with, but it should be an active part of our daily lives. Mm -hmm. So Ramadan is one of those aspects of, of this, uh, these five fundamentals of Islam that really focuses on that notion of, uh, of, uh, of the, the, the feeling, the the, the coming together as we do in the mornings when we wake up for uh, suhoor, our, our morning breakfast, when the little ones are awakened from their sleep, mm -hmm. which is in itself another issue. <laughs> sure. um, and we take this pre-dawn meal, um, and then we pray immediately thereafter as a family. So you see that the families are com coming closer together in the practice of the faith. Youngsters are being socialized to understand something about this idea of sacrifice and finding out that they're more disciplined than they might think they are. Mm -hmm. They're more mature in their outlook of the world and what's in it than they might think that they are. And they get an opportunity to practice that with their family members. At the end of the fast, we all get together for iftar. And iftar is, again, the breaking of the fast. And Allah has said in the Quran, there are two things that the Muslim enjoys in this world. Uh, one is when he meets his or her meets his Lord or her Lord, and the other is when she or he breaks the fast of mm -hmm. Ramadan. So this is the the uh, ultimate act of enjoyment mm -hmm. of, of fulfillment, um, and at the same time, it's a communal effort because we come together as a community. And at least uh, once a week in West Springfield, we have a communal iftar where everyone who can come comes to the masjid mm -hmm. and we break our fast. Following the fast or following the breaking of the fast and following the Isha prayer, mm -hmm. there has come to, uh, to uh, a, a, a sort of additional aspect that brings the community together is the recitation of the Tarawih Salah mm -hmm. where Muslims pray at least uh, eight raqah which can take a half an hour as a jamaat in the masjid, mm -hmm. sometimes praying up to 26 rakah, which can take an hour or so. And in that time, um, one thirtieth of the Quran is recited every night during the month of Ramadan. Mm -hmm. And therefore, at the end of Ramadan, the complete Quran is recited for those who come every, every night for Taraweeh. So again, Ramadan is uh, a test for all of us fasting and abstaining from food and drink at a time in this hemisphere when it's HHH hot, hazy, and humid, <laughs> is a real challenge. Sure. I'm, I'm my work at the jail, um, we find these young men who have become um, um, a foul of society in one way or another, many, many of them or most of them, and have been led to believe that um, they are marginalized, outcast individuals, that they're weak in character, etc. Well, they find out during the month of Ramadan that they have a chance to show themselves that they are in fact as strong as anyone else, that they are indeed noble people. They mm -hmm. can begin to look at themselves as individuals capable of satisfying higher level appetites. And the appetite not to eat is a highest level appetite when it comes to the physicalness or physicality rather of sure. looking at food sure. uh, as something that someone cannot do without. Being able to abstain from it mm -hmm. for the purpose of satisfying the creator is indeed an act of uh, nobility. 
Um, and there are other aspects of this fast that I think uh, we'll have to wait for a future show. Of we course. We can talk about Ramadan for the next half hour. Absolutely. And this is something that um, the Islamic faith has in common with other monotheistic traditions as well. Yes. Well, it's important to understand also that Islam never, uh, the Prophet never saw himself as someone who brought a new religion. Mm -hmm. That when you begin to really delve into Islam and you look at the origins of the faith, and you look at the, the, the life of the Prophet Muhammad and his, um, uh, his family history, you see that Muhammad is a relative, direct relative of Abraham, who we look upon as the, the paternal figure of mm -hmm. the monotheistic faiths. Um, most uh, Christians understand that Abraham had a wife, her, her name was Sarah. And they may understand, if they look closely at the religion in a serious way, that he also had a, a second wife called Hajjah, mm -hmm. who was called Hagar. Mm -hmm. And this woman in the Christian uh, uh, tradition is usually looked upon as a, a, a house servant or a slave. Islamically, we look upon Hagar, uh, Hajjah, again, as the, uh, the wife of our noble prophet Abraham, Ibrahim. Mm -hmm. um, long story short, Sarah was barren, could not have children. Mm -hmm. Hajjah did have a child named Ismail. Later, uh, Sarah had a child. His name was Isaac. Mm -hmm. Isaac had a son. His name was Jacob. Changed his name later to Israel. Uh, Israel. Mm -hmm. He had 12 sons, and those are the 12 sons of Israel, from whom uh, one of the progenitors, uh, I'm sorry, the successors of some, one of the offspring, is a man named Moses or Musa. Mm -hmm. And later on in that litany, mm -hmm. there is a man named Jesus who was born as the son of Mary, Jesus, right. son of Mary. So on that side, we see the Judeo-Christian aspect of mm -hmm. the monotheistic faiths. On the other side, the progeny of Ismail, we go down that lineage and we see a man named Abdullah, mm -hmm. who has a son named Muhammad. Mm -hmm. So that the religions are not only linked in terms of their theology, they're linked actually literally in terms of their genealogy. Sure. So these Abrahamic faiths, it's not coincidental that they share notions of the belief in one God. Mm -hmm. It's not coincidental that they share the idea of prayer. It's not coincidental that they share the idea of charity. It's not coincidental that they share far more than they have that is different, and that they overlap in very significant ways. In those ways, I think, and most of us think, who are looking at this religion and, and the way that the prophet looked at it, mm -hmm. are ways and opportunities for these great far-reaching monotheistic faiths to become true brothers, mm -hmm. to know one another, to understand these similarities, and to embrace, rather than, as you quoted earlier in the statistical analysis that you gave, to become alien to one another. Mm -hmm. So again, I think that part of our job here today is to stress this, the similarities, to stress the commonalities that we share, and I hope that uh, further along the road, uh, we can bring these faiths together in a way that will generate the kind of brotherliness and brotherhood and sisterhood that I think is essential for us as we move forward. And I guess improving understanding of each other's faiths does not necessarily mean a dilution of our own particular understanding or practice of that faith as well. Not at all, not at all. I think that the, the idea that um, we're in competition um, and that that competition, which is very common to our culture here in this country, is one that has no place in this particular sort of religious theological culture. Mm -hmm. Quite the contrary. What we should stress, again, are the similarities that flow from belief, from the positiveness of belief, mm -hmm. from the notion that all of these prophets, their message was the same. It's not that Jesus brought a message that was different than Moses' message. It's not that Muhammad's message is different from David's or Daoud's message. It's not that Suleiman or Solomon's message is different from the message given to Isaac or Jacob or the others or the tribes, and not at all. They are affirmations one of the other. Mm -hmm. And I think it's that aspect that is lost when we begin to succumb to the notion of these religions being only political, we're talking about political Absolutely. Islam, political Christianity, in case of the radical Christians and mm -hmm. the David Koresh's of the world, uh, political Judaism, in the case of some of the radical Jewish movements that took place in this country and, in, and also in the, in the Middle East, rather than exploit that kind of 
rift for mm -hmm. newsworthiness and the selling of newspapers and sure. television footage, I think that which does none of us a service. It leads to the kind of extraordinary intercenin and, and other kinds of violence that plague us now. We should, those of us who have this understanding, which I think is more correct and more in line with the message of these great and noble mm -hmm. monotheistic prophets, these great Semitic prophets, we should take the reins mm -hmm. and begin to put that message out there with a, a, a more rigorous kind of way. And uh, with, the, again, the intent of educating all of us in our various religious faiths about each other's faith. I mean, we as Muslims should know more about the Jewish faith. We as Christians, or those of us who are Christians, should know more about their Muslim and Jewish brothers. Um, we look at the history of Judaism, we understand mm, the suppression, repression, of inordinate violence meted out by pogroms in Europe, etc. Um, this is something that was born of ignorance. And the more we buy into that notion of not knowing, sticking our heads in the sand, and becoming, um, you know, drum majors for our own faith mm -hmm. to the exclusion of other faiths. To that same extent, we can count on this kind of violence repeating itself sure. in a way that will be destructive for all of us. Great, thank you. Um, let's now turn to this concept of Sharia mm. and the term Sharia, which is quite controversial here in the U.S. It um, raises a lot of fears amongst uh, Americans in general. And um, if, for the benefit of our audience, if you could sort of help explain what Sharia is. Okay, Sharia. Sharia is an Arabic word that literally means a watering place. Mm -hmm. And as all of these Semitic religions were revealed in the climate where <laughs> the sun shines very brightly, someone okay. was saying the other day, you know, when I, when I made Hajj, I washed my uh, jalabiya, my shirt, and I put it on a line, and it was dry, bone dry in about <laughs> two minutes. Sure. Um, a watering place in, means, of course, a place of nurturing, a place where someone goes to, mm. to feel refreshed. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, Sharia is um, the underpinnings, the legal underpinnings of the religion of Islam. It's derived from the Quran mm -hmm. and from the sayings recorded sayings, or hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And these two sources, which the Prophet on his, uh, his last uh, and final khutbah at Arafah before he passed on, he said, I leave you two things, which if you follow them, you will never go astray. The first is the book of Allah, meaning the Quran, mm -hmm. and the second is my sunnah, meaning his tradition. Mm -hmm. So the Sharia is basically a compilation of Islamic uh, law, based upon the Qur'an and the uh, life of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, my daughter's an attorney, mm -hmm. and um, I remember going into her office for the first time and seeing all those, those, those books lined up in that, that, that bookshelf, and all attorneys, they, of course, they, they thrive in <laughs> showing people um, the basis of their profession, and it's <laughs> contained in that, those, those books. Sure. Those books are actually case law. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's, um, we have in this country law based on s state practice and uh, state laws, and, and et cetera, and, and the, um, the actual practice of each case is recorded as a precedent, so that mm -hmm. should that case be um, um, a similar case, rather, come to light, they mm -hmm. have case law to, to, to go on. The same thing applies in Islam, and that is called fiqh. Mm -hmm. The application of sharia, the application of the law is called fiqh, or jurisprudence mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in English term parlance. Um, but sharia for the common Muslim, in the same way that I don't know what's in those books mm -hmm. that my daughter has that govern life in this country, mm -hmm. most Muslims have no clue what sharia is in any kind of legalistic sense. That's why there are judges and lawyers who do this kind of work, in mm -hmm. the same way there are judges and lawyers who do it in this country. Sure. What we're concerned with in this country is a basic understanding of legal practices so that we know, for example, if we're driving in a car, not to go 100 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour zone. Mm -hmm. um, if you do that, you'll end up in court and mm -hmm. they'll pull out one of those books and <laughs> say, well, you're guilty of this crime right. and this is the punishment for that crime. Mm -hmm. But fundamentally, um, we go about our lives um, with a sort of a, a, a fundamental awareness of the law. And the same thing is true with Sharia. Mm -hmm. For example, we understand that Sharia governs the fact that we pray five times a day. Mm -hmm. That we look in the Quran and we can see that we're supposed to pray. We look in the Sunnah and we find out exactly how to pray. We understand that we have to pay zakah. We don't know 
reading the Quran exactly how much to pay, but reading the hadith or the tradition of the Prophet Muhammad, we find out exactly how much we have to pay. So that these are fundamental observances for the common Muslim that uh, oversee our lives. Uh, we aren't preoccupied with them as such, but we're aware of them, mm -hmm. and we pr try with all our heart mm -hmm. um, not to violate them. So, for example, in the case of Ramadan, just a while ago, before I did this tape, I was asking for a drink of water because <laughs> yes. I'd forgotten that I was fasting. I was in the moment. Sure. So, again, it's Sharia that tells me, no, it's the laws and the, the dictates of the month of Ramadan are such that mm -hmm. we're not supposed to, my phone is going off, <laughs> we're not supposed to drink or eat in the month of Ramadan. How do we find that out? It's Sharia. It's part of the Islamic law, and it's manifest in fiqh. Uh, my, my not... Um, uh, drinking that cup of water is a sure. manifestation of that. So while the media is looking at Sharia and, and looking at some of the more drastic um, applications of Sharia law, the cutting off of hands and mm -hmm. the stoning the death of people, you know, I tell my students oftentimes when they ask about um, mm -hmm. Sharia and these kinds of things, um, you know, there's no pleasant way to take someone's life Capital crimes in this country are punishable in many cities, cities, or cities, in many states, by hanging, by electrocution. I don't think that's pleasant. Mm -hmm. um, by injection of drugs, mm -hmm. I don't think that's pleasant mm -hmm. either. In the old days of the Parisian um, uh, society, it was the guillotine. So, you know, to focus on that and to use that as a way of looking at a body of law and focusing only on that does this religion of Islam a disservice. And uh, again, it's another example sure. of how the religion is, is sort of like looked at in a lopsided way without looking at the positive aspects, the more common aspect that we all practice every day. Um, it's the same way, I guess, when we look at certain communities and we see a repetition of, of the bad things that happen in those communities, the people who are being killed and shot and maimed or whatever, without looking at some of the good things that are predominant. Sure. It's only a small percentage, two or three percent, of any community that are involved habitually in crime. Mm -hmm. We see that that sells newspapers, it gives right. people a, a, a view of uh, a society that is, is lopsided and distorted. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for that, um, Dr. Ali. And, you know, we will go into other aspects of Sharia and we'll go into more details about, you know, um, concepts like Sharia, Jihad, the role of women in Islam, as we will continue our conversation uh, in the coming weeks. And I'd like to once again thank you so much for your time and for your insights. And um, thank you all so much for watching. Until next time.